Hi, everybody in podcast land and also on YouTube. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Sarah. And today, the Carpool Critics Podcast is talking about Christopher Nolan's 11th movie, Tenet. We went to... Was that a spoiler? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to spend the first five minutes or whatever not spoiling anything. You're safe if you haven't seen the movie yet. Then we will give a big, loud and clear spoiler alert and talk about the real juicy stuff. Uh, so we saw this movie in the theater last night. Ooh. First time in a while. The side of the building still had a poster for <laughs> damn Doolittle on it, man. Doolittle in theaters January 17th. Oh, He's just not a people person. That was just brutal. It was like it was like the, the movie theater industry equivalent of dying on the toilet. Like, <laughs> that is the poster that's on the building for the next eight months. Yeah, man. That's rough. I found that the going to the movie theater wasn't that weird or different uh, if I was seeing a matinee on like a Tuesday. But the, yeah. given that it was opening night of a blockbuster, it was a little weird because there was just no lineups anywhere. I got to sit with no one around me. It was lovely. Yeah. I, was I'm dope. super into that. Like, there's a lot of things about COVID that I really like, like having limited amount of people in stores or cafes and you just wait outside. Like, I'm, I like that. And this is something I could really go for, having no one beside me. Like, I usually have to choose crappy seats if I want no one beside me, but now every seat is a prime seat. Yeah, and if you really don't want anyone beside you, you buy one of those. Like at the Cinebox we were at, there was groups of two seats and then single seats. And if you are <laughs> a real asshole, you book by yourself one of those double seats so you get a spare chair beside you to put your crap in. <laughs> Although you always get the chairs beside you. Because you have three chairs in between. There's groups. no real advantage to doing that. You have four chairs in between. You really don't like people. You're just a jerk. Or if you haven't showered for six days. When the movie started, my first uh, thought about being back in the movie theater was, this is loud. Oh, yeah, you weren't there. So as a company, we went to see Edge of Tomorrow in theaters. And I, that was exactly the same thing. The screen is huge. And it's so loud. And I didn't like how loud it was. Actually, in this movie in particular, I think, um, is special in this respect. Mm -hmm. I Online, I was wondering if people had the same experience as me, which is, I missed 20% of the dialogue in this oh, movie. Oh, 100%. What? Definitely. It's a confusing movie to begin with, but what the hell are they saying? And the consensus online, people are asking, is it my theater screwing up the mix and they just don't have the levels properly? Or is it Christopher Nolan's fault? And the consensus seems to be, it's Nolan's fault because this is like the third movie it's been like this. Yeah. Inception, or excuse me, Interstellar, uh, I, we actually talked about it in our previous Interstellar episode about how the dynamics are so spread out that yeah. if you're watching it at home, you're waking up the baby with explosions yeah. and then cranking it up to hear people talk. And that continued on Dunkirk. And here it is probably in its worst form ever on Tenet. Yeah, I agree. I think that this is like the final end game of it. And I think he will correct after this. But this it's pretty unacceptable. Like it's you like you said, you miss 20 percent of the dialogue and there's so much quick explanations in one line of stuff and you just miss it and then it happens and you're like huh oh i guess someone said that before like uh yeah i don't want to spoil this but there's some pretty big things that happen and i'm like wait when did that happen and i'm like i guess i missed it there are things that i found out about the movie only from reading after i'm like oh they they said that i thought we didn't know that for like an hour <laughs> yeah but totally. they just said that up front yeah. and part of the reason is that a lot of the explanations of what they're going to do happen during action, which is a nice thing in a movie. You know, if someone's going to sit there and talk, it's nice if they're walking and talking or, you know, driving and talking It's setting stuff up or suiting up and talking. And because they're doing these actions, those actions are higher in the mix than their voices a lot of the time. Yeah. You just can't hear what's going on. Yeah. I totally agree. There was just so much like noise layering that he did instead of trying to balance out a lot of the things. He was just like, let's just make everything louder. Yeah. And then when the action hit, it was like, Yes. Oh, that's that is uncomfortably loud. I, w I would turn it down a bit. Yeah, you could tell that like that was a loud enough level that it would damage your hearing for sustained amounts of time. There was someone on Reddit who said that they their hand reached for a phantom remote during the movie because <laughs> they wanted to turn it down. Totally. I'm super. I agree. I think that I think he's just gotten more and more bold with that dynamic range and he just needs to be corrected. And maybe he's beyond correction because he's Christopher Nolan. But someone needs to be like, yo, dude. Yo, Mr. Nolan, let's tone it down a little bit. Well, it really is a shame because this movie, as I said, is like it's confusing enough. The dialogue is very quick and snappy and, and spy. You know, in spy, this is a spy movie. And in spy movies, the people are always very competent. And when everyone's super competent and smart, they do these quick one-liners where they're like two steps ahead of each other. So the information is coming really fast. And I need to hear all that information. This was the only movie I've ever sat in where I wished there were subtitles on. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. 
I felt the same. Yeah, I, I, my movie theater experience was very different because I couldn't rewind. I couldn't go back. I couldn't see what I missed. It was just like, if you miss it, you miss it. There's no going back. So, But the movie was still uh, kind of intelligible. For me, it landed in an area where it's like, I got the gist. Even if I had subtitles and or understood all the dialogue audibly, I probably would still want to rewatch it because it seems like there's a lot uh, layered in this movie. I wonder if the upshot of all of this, of the audio and the confusingness of this movie, r- will result in just more tickets sold because everyone needs to see it twice. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to get into my rating, but I, I will watch this movie again, but I doubt I'll see it in theaters again. I, I think it's one of those ones I'll wait till it gets on home. It's probably going to be on streaming sooner than it normally would. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the questions I was left with are such minutia. Uh, they're not like broad strokes because like you said, you understand the grand scheme of things, the big picture and those little questions, like maybe they add a little more to the layer of it and maybe they make this movie a little more intelligible, but I don't care. I do want to see it again. I want to see it with all my friends. It's actually a shame because uh, it, if you think about like me and my five friends are going to go, if like four groups of people think that, this theater's sold out. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's going to take forever to see this yeah. movie again because we bought our tickets like two weeks ago. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to change the system where like a group of four can then condense because then they could fit more people. Like they might build a better algorithm. Maybe they're just working that out right now. Mm. Like that'd be way smarter. Instead of having this set two, three, one, three, two system, just like make it more dynamic. If it were going to be that dynamic, it would have to... I don't think they could tell you your seat number right when you buy it. Because like if you buy a group of five like in a row and then someone else buys a group of five and then there's just like a random number of seats on the end, they need to move you over to be able to fit more people on the end. Yeah, but I think though because that they're they're not... I thought what they were going to do is they were going to do... Every, there's people in every row and they were going to stagger the group so that like you're still far enough because of the group the rows are staggered. But every second row was just empty anyway. So you could have... Like the the group, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you could fit more people in an area. I think. I think there's a better way to do this. I don't know. I think you kind of do need that empty row ahead of you because like droplets, you know, so well, coughs. Or welcome something. to the new podcast, COVID Theater Logistics. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say too, it's kind of nice having less people because you know that the people who are there are definitely there because they love movies. Yeah. Whereas before, when you'd go to the theater, everybody's there just kind of for pleasure. Yeah. Not everybody, but obviously a large amount of people. And so this time, you can sit down and like genuinely enjoy the movie with whoever no else phones. is around totally. you. There was yeah. no phones yeah. opening up nobody was really talking i think that's totally a a nice side of this is that everyone's just there to watch the movie i will say i think there's like an energy when there's a full theater and that energy doesn't exist because it's not a full theater and like there's no like excitement there's no like group laughter there's no like (gasps) and i i found that energy that's created by like the theater experience just doesn't exist right now and that's fine but i think i found myself missing that a little bit because i actually left this movie with no idea how anyone felt about that movie. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess that's true. I didn't really know how you guys even felt. I kind of like had a little seizure. I was like so full of things I wanted to <laughs> say and ask and ah, and energy. I just, I, I really liked it. Should we get into our ratings? Sure. Yeah. Okay, David, what okay. do you give this movie out of 10? Oh, yeah. I, don't I actually have no idea what you're going to yeah. say, no, man. No, me neither. You don't like Inception that much. <laughs> okay, here we go. In Tenant, Christopher Nolan replaces the spectacle of Inception, the mystery of uh, Memento, and the, the interesting characterization of the Dark Knight to replace them with incomprehensible and numerous time travel tropes that end up never paying off and going nowhere. Six out of ten. Six out of what? ten! <laughs> yeah, this movie sucks. Whoa! <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Sarah. All well. right. The best way for me to summarize my thoughts in this movie is with one word, bamboozled. (laughs) 7.9 out of 10. Nice. Okay. Okay. What did you take points off for? Generally, generally. uh, Just like I looked at the basic themes and uh, kind of like the film style, the music, compiled all of that together and then took marks off depending on how I felt about those specific things. So that's how I did my rating. Okay. If that makes any sense whatsoever. Okay. Tenet is the nameless love child of a threesome between a James Bond movie, Interstellar, and Inception. And honestly, if, it, if the audio was mixed better and I could hear what was going on, it would almost be a perfect movie. I'm giving it like a 9.25. I really liked it. And I think after I see it again, I will really, really like it. 
I will say, I, my original score was a seven. I'm just feeling a little spicy today. Um, <laughs> and I think that on repeat watchings, I might learn to like it more because I'll buy into the layers. And I think that you have a buy into Christopher Nolan movies where you're willing to like go where he leads you, even if you don't get it. Whereas I have a resistance to Christopher Nolan movies where I'm like, if you don't take me step by step, I'm not going. I wonder, I think it comes down to um, ego and self-consciousness. I think, I assume that if... Um, if I'm not getting all of it on the first pass, then I'm just dumb. And it's like, it's probably all there, and I'll give it another chance, and I'll just absorb it, and I'm the dumb one. Whereas you might be like, no, I can understand every movie, and if I'm if it's not delivered properly, then it's your failure as a filmmaker. I, th- I definitely think it's a combo. I think it is a movie that he intended people to study and evaluate, just like Memento, Memento where on the first watch, it's kind of hard to, to understand, and the more you watch, the more you like it. But... Memento has such an incredible payoff on the first watch where even though you might not get all the details when the reveal happens and everything is flipped on its head you're like holy shit this is insane and this movie kind of has uh, like uh, moments where it's like we're flipping the expectation and then it's like oh that that that's all you're pulling out of this that's like that's the payoff for me I think it really comes back down to the audio mixing and I should actually clarify a lot of people online said that the audio was fine for them um, so I don't know if they're in a if they heard different things like they heard a different mix than I did or if they just weren't bothered by it. Um, but and there's a lot of people wearing masks and crap in this movie, so, like Bane style. It's just really hard to hear what people are saying, and that for me really plays into the enjoyment of the movie because I am sure that Nolan wants me to be confused about some things sometimes. He, you know, a good filmmaker does that. There you have questions. What is going on? I'm I'm intentionally confused, but he is not in control of what I can't hear, like what information I'm missing. And so to me that I just found myself at the end being like, what are they doing here? Like what, what's their like uh, the goal right now? I don't even know. And he wants me to know that fact. And so that actually erodes payoffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it comes, I mean, uh, we got to get into spoilers sometime soon because I, I, my problems (laughs) are all very specific, but I would say that it's worth watching the movie. If you like Christopher Nolan movies, um, I'm not a huge Christopher Nolan movie so, fan, so this for me ranks probably just below Inception. Uh, I think Inception has way more cool stuff that I was like, "Wow, this is interesting." But Inception's a lot more of a simple movie that more people will understand. And my prediction: what a statement! When when that movie came out in 2010, it was like mind blowing. It was a yeah. cultural impact. Everybody was like, "What even just happened? What did I watch?" But now we're all just used to that, and yeah. he's studying the bar of confusion <laughs> again. again. Yeah, it's maybe like, in 10 years we'll be like, "Yeah, Tenet, that's so basic." Um, I just, I don't think this movie will do nearly as well. Cause again, Inception, like Memento, the first time you watch it, there's a wow. And Tenant, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that like the first time I watched it, it was like things all fell into place. There was a reversal of expectation. There was, there was no big like, holy smokes, this is so cool. Whereas I feel like every Christopher Nolan movies has kind of had, had that. I had moments like that for me. For okay. Sure. Oh, um, I, I felt like David. I was like, there's got to be a really good plot twist at the end or like yeah. something insane is going to happen. Yeah. And then when it ended, I was like, oh, well, yeah. I thought that was going to happen the well, whole yeah. time. Oh, like, I, was like, I, I thought they'd already explained that. Yeah, and, exactly. Like, yeah, like there's a, ugh, I got to get in spoilers, but there's so many time travel tropes that this movie pretends like it's totally new and original. I'm like, come on, like, come on, do better. Uh, so the fact that, uh, is that a spoiler saying that there's, time travel stuff in this movie or is that all it's, in the trailers it's on the trailers because i didn't watch the trailers so i was like too totally fresh and sweet well maybe we should enter spoiler territory well what do you think I where think, do you think this ranks on the christopher nolan scale uh i mean it's obviously gonna be higher than a lot of early stuff like insomnia and following and yeah. and stuff like that and <laughs> dark knight rises um but is it better than p- favorites like inception and interstellar it'll probably rank higher for a lot of people than dunkirk I f- Boo. dunkirk's the best dunkirk could could very well be the best but i think to like your average nolan fan it's a little a bit of a departure from what they really like from him um so i would say that for a lot of people tenant will be in their top three yeah. nolan movies for me i gotta watch it again but i i would say it's it's up there for me i really sure. did like it what about you for you sarah um so disclaimer i've only ever watched one other christopher nolan movie you and monster. it was dunkirk oh, okay that's so the best one. On my ranking between Dunkirk... Pause you! 
You haven't seen any of the Batman movies. <laughs> no. You haven't seen I don't watch superhero movies. movies. This is insanity. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's kind of nice because I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm coming from somebody who loves like intricate artsy movies. Yeah. So thank I kind you. of, okay, thank I'm you. picking up more on like the Welcome. plot and the acting and the characters and the cinematography and the music. Like, and I think this movie did really well in those, well, some of those points. Some of them. Um, but between Tenet and Dunkirk, I would definitely say I preferred Tenet. <gasps> oh wow so <laughs> i don't I'm know so angry we'll what see. a twist what a <laughs> twist all right guys let's actually get into this movie now spoiler alert. spoiler alert i tried my best to synopsize this movie i think that you should have watched this movie the synopsis if you haven't seen the movie isn't really going to clarify anything for <laughs> for you but here it goes anyway after a botched raid that results in an unnamed agent biting down on a supposed suicide pill, our protagonist, played by John David Washington, that's Denzel's son, baby, wakes up to learn the pill actually induced a coma. He's told that his decision to choose suicide demonstrated such loyalty as to qualify him for a new mission to save the world. The protagonist, who's never given a name, <clears throat> doesn't know who he's working for or who's on his team. He only knows a code word, tenet, which has an accompanying gesture. He uses the code word to network through various contacts, eventually learning that people facing an existential crisis in the future have sent special inverted objects back through time. These objects have inverted entropy and thus travel through time in the opposite direction to what we're used to. Among these objects are nine pieces to a nuclear device called the algorithm, which will invert the entire world, causing the end of the universe because science reasons. The antagonist, Andre Sator, 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 whatever, S-A-T-O-R. He's an arms dealer who has collected the nine pieces of the algorithm, and if he dies, the bomb goes off. The protagonist must manipulate, punch, and time travel his way to a future where the pieces of the algorithm are separated and hidden with no one person knowing where they're all buried. Uh, there's a, a really huge female character named Kat in there that I didn't mention in the synopsis at all. She's the wife. I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't yeah. fit into this explanation, uh, but it's a big deal. And we're going back in time to do our sponsors before we do anything else. Carpool Critics is sponsored by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels, including the greatest ball hair trimmer on the planet, David, the Lawn Mower 3.0. <laughs> this puppy has a ceramic blade, 7,000 RPM quiet strip motor, and even an LED light so you can see what you're doing down there. You get 20% off and free shipping with the code CARPOOL at manscaped.com. We're also brought to you by Private Internet Access VPN. PIA helps you hide your true IP address so that you can bypass your restrictions and censorship. Yeah! You can connect up to 10 devices at once, and it includes an internet kill switch, Sarah. Woo! <laughs> if your VPN gets disconnected involuntarily. PIA is, is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a god dang Chrome extension, so check it out at lmg.gg slash carpoolcritics. I think, yeah, you can get bogged down into the kind of the details and the minute to minutes of the movie, but really, it's really simple. It's there's a, a time nuke that's going to go off and they have to stop it. I feel like the the reason that you can, you can get bogged down in all that minute to minute stuff is because of the James Bond globe trotting espionage nature of the film mm -hmm. where just like in a James Bond movie, it's like now he's on the beach in Morocco. Now he's on a yacht in Ankara or yeah. whatever. Is Ankara a place? I was going to say Ankara Wat, but there's no yachts there because it's land. All I'm saying is they're all over the they're all over the world talking to lots of different contacts and it moves pretty fast. To me, this movie was like Christopher Nolan made a James Bond movie. Uh, as a James Bond fan, I take offense to that and I demand a retraction immediately. I don't retract it. It to me it was like if he made it this is exactly James Bond with some wacky time stuff, therefore it's Christopher Nolan. <laughs> James Bond. I think what it was missing for me to be a good James Bond movie is like good action set pieces. I think all the fights were fine. Like I think the restaurant fight. What? The one time he fights in the restaurant was pretty cool. But the reverse fight was like kind of lame. It was like an okay fight. Uh, the, I will give you that. I was a little um, disappointed in the reverse the, fight. Like, but the reverse bungee jumping was like kind of uh, cool. It uh, was like nah. But also like there was a weird motion blur that must, must have been added or like some post effect that looked really bad. Especially on the jump down. Uh, the they, plane, they weren't I inverted with that bungee. Well, like when they were snapped up. That wasn't even inverted. I know, but I'm, I'm. It's like they say, oh, they say bungee, but inverted. That's what they say as the precursor to that scene. They're not yeah. actually using an inverted bungee. Yeah, I, I thought they were gonna use like a bungee from the future that was reversed, and then they were just gonna like. Whoop. Yeah, so did I, but they didn't. Thank but then God. They, but they did it in such a way that I had to like. Is that inverted or not? Like I had to like yeah, yeah. you know work that out, which is weird. But what about the action set piece of the car chase? 
the car chase where suddenly there's cars on the road that are going backwards and stuff. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, it was okay. Like, there's a few problems in that scene. Like, why is the gas pedal still depressed? That like, was a question I actually yeah, was going to so ask. There's, there's a, no one in the car, and this car is speeding yeah. in a straight line, but there's no human in the car. And, and then they show, there's there's no, no, they there's show no the pedal, and there's no brick, there's nothing. So how do they do that? Because It's just they didn't think about it. What? They and it also kind of bothered me that, that when the protagonist gets into the car and he slams the brakes... Um, he's like really reaching his hands really extended and then he just uses his like fingertips to hit the brake pedal. I was like, what? You slamming the brakes with the tip of your finger? You got to smash that pedal. What is that? Yeah, I, I think my problem with this movie is that it pretends like it takes meticulous like attention to detail. But then there's just like a lot of flagrant just like they're not really thinking about it. Like well, there's an armored truck that they blow up into and then he puts a bunch of C4 on the door to blow it up. And he's like two meters away inside it in a small enclosed metal space, blows it up. His ears would explode. Like there is no world in which this is like and he keeps going. Like it's just like they just don't think about those details in this movie. And I did not get a sense that they were really caring about that. They were just like cool time travel James Bond fight movie. And I, okay. I think that really took away from my ability to buy in in the same way that the prestige loses me a lot where i'm like they didn't really think about the like crazy world that they were building they're just like magic movie with extra space science and, and i felt that with this quite a bit i wish uh, going back to like the fight scenes and stuff the action packed whatever mm -hmm. um there were so many fight scenes where i was like this could be so much more like gory and intense than it is <laughs> the a24 I mean, fan i know here. coming from somebody who loves like tarantino movies who loves a24 movies um i just love that blood and gore and the only time i really felt that like oh was when the cheese grater was taken to the face yeah i felt that too <laughs> I was like, oh, cringe. but even that was off screen <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and then like when the train is going past um, and I believe it was Andre, Andre in the beginning pulling out no, um, protagonist teeth. Different person, wasn't it? Was it? A, yeah. He was Russian. This is a, very Russian, but this is actually something I wanted to figure out. Um, he really does kind of look like him if he just maybe shaved his face. It's not though. It's I not don't Kenneth think Branagh. it's not. Okay. They okay. say the Kenneth Branagh reveal for a big con moment that makes no sense. They're like, <laughs> yeah. there's like, so they hide the face of. Kenneth Branagh for the first half of the movie, and at one point they reveal him with like a big like, Wah! and you're like. Who is he? <laughs> and it's just like, it's like the con moment where you're like, it's a meta moment where in this, it's like the con moment into, into darkness where he's like, my name is con, but it means literally nothing to the people in the movie. And it's only for the audience's sake. And it just feels so artificial. And they do the same thing in here where it's like, Oh, look, it's Kenneth Branagh. He must be important. <laughs> yeah, I was like, who is this relatively unknown? I've never seen this guy before. Even though I found out, oh, it's Kenneth Branagh, a name I've definitely heard a bazillion yeah, yeah, times. Yeah. But then I go to his IMDb and I'm like, who is Kenneth Branagh? <laughs> <laughs> Wild Wild West, that's his most important film. He's in a lot. He was in Dunkirk. I definitely saw him in that and enjoyed him there. But he had, for me, a compelling performance, but such a generic face that he didn't have any really gravitas to me. And maybe that's why in James Bond movies, they always have a big stupid scar on their face or yeah. something. Well, I think we're trained for that. We need like a tick. Like the best James Bond movie, the best villain we've had is Mads Nicholson. And it's because he had like the weeping eye and the scar and like the kind of, he has a weird face as it is. And I think that helps to really sell how cool they are. Or like in other Nolan movies, you've got like Marion Cot Cotillard being like, wow, she's like, has this really intense, cool look and a, like a weird accent, and I like that. This guy just had like Russian accent, very stoic and very, you know, very USSR. Like I have bum, and he's just really <laughs> boring. Yeah, yeah, and he's just angry, and he, he yeah, he, his emotions go from like neutral to furious. Yeah, yeah, there's not much like diversity in it. He was he was still good, but yeah, I just kind of I didn't have a lot of impact when I saw him just because he looked so generic. Yeah, I'd say that kind of extends to most of the characters. I think John David Washington is an excellent actor and he's very charismatic. And so he does a lot with what he's given. But I think that you could actually play like shuffle the actors in this movie and you would have almost no impact. Like you could change Robert Pattinson and him it wouldn't really change. You could change like Kenneth Brown and the wife. Like you could kind of do this weird shuffle. And there's there's so little characterization in these characters that like it wouldn't matter. I actually don't think you could switch Pattinson and John and Washington. Oh. Because I think that I think I don't know for sure, but I think that the mo there's a meta like subtext where the movie is saying something um where they are they are very self-aware that they chose Washington in that role and that I think there are signals and winking at the audience during the movie huh. that they chose him. Oh, I didn't get that at all. And so That's okay. Well, here I don't know. Let me explain myself and tell me please, if I'm just reaching here. 
So I felt I was trying to figure out what the what is the character arc of the protagonist. Okay, what is he? What is his flaw at the beginning? What does he change for at the end? And I didn't really find a lot, except I think it might be sense of belonging or imposter syndrome, because the big reveal at the end is that he is he is tenant. He is the one who is orchestrating the whole organization, right? And so, but at the beginning, they say multiple times when he wakes up from the coma, they're like, you're awesome. You're special. The fact that you you like chose suicide rather than divulging information and interrogation, nobody else would do that. And he kind of, he doesn't really react to it too much. He kind of brushes it off. And to me, I got the sense that it's just like, he's like, I don't believe you really. He's yeah. just like, I'm just a regular guy, whatever. Then throughout the first act, we see him interact with all these like billionaires in the spy world, and they keep telling him, uh, "You, we know you don't belong. Your your suit is obviously cheap. You don't have the etiquette and the mannerisms. You don't belong in this world." And they actually say, um, "A fresh face. You've got a fresh face." Okay. And so, I think the narrative arc is he's getting to belong, right? But I think that the like subtext arc is that Nolan knows that he made a James Bond movie with a black James Bond. Mm. And I don't, I think, I know a lot of people are going to re already, but I, th- <laughs> but here's why I think that it's actually, I'm not just like looking for that in the movie, but it's actually there. It seems like there was tons of shots and lines where they are, they're like saying to the audience, like, and, and the characters are saying to the, to each other, uh, there's a black guy in, in a spot where there's a, supposed to be a yeah. white guy. Yeah, and, and, and like Christopher Nolan movies are like white people ass movies. Yeah, they're they're super all white. like super white movies. Yeah. And Robert Pattinson normally would have been the protagonist yeah. in this movie, but he's not. And, th- and here's a couple examples of why I think that the movie is actually intentionally doing this. Yeah, yeah. One is they do say fresh face uh, to the whole you don't belong thing. Uh, three, there's just shots that you're like, why would that even be in here? Like when he's riding in a speedboat and another speedboat goes by and he like gives it finger guns and he's like hey i'm in the speedboat now motherfucker yeah, yeah, yeah. uh that i uh, damn it i just say motherfucker okay i wasn't trying to do black voice <laughs> <laughs> he's, it, it just seemed like um being at the golf country club being like ha we're here now uh and then there's just other subtler things that i think uh, representation wise kind of feed into the fact that this is a bit different like washington is five foot nine okay and they don't hide that in this movie at all. They accentuate it. Yes. Uh, across from the character Kat, played by Dubicki, Elizabeth Dubicki. Uh, Debicki? I don't know. She's six foot two point eight. Like, she's With so heels. tall. Yeah. She's huge. And there's all the other characters in the movie, they just, they don't do any forced perspective to make him look like a big hero. It's just, he's 509. And, and so I just think that... Um, they, they don't try to have this Bond girl who he gets to make out with and everything, who is petite and perfect and feminine. It's just everybody just is who they are. And, and so I think that is nested in with the narrative of like, uh, you're here passing the torch. Uh, it's a fresh face and, and you do belong. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a fair interpretation. I actually don't think you're reaching that far. I think I wish that that aspect of the movie was better married to the time travel because I feel like the questions that the time travel poses. And I think that the primary question is like the greed of the rich. Like if I can't have it, no one can. And that's like kind of the central thesis of the movie. And I guess, do you think that that ties into this idea of like a black protagonist and kind of like alternative representation that like, if I can't be the center of the movie, I don't want it like that. Do you think that that could be tied into that? I don't know. I feel like I'm, I haven't thought of that. And I think that I might be reaching if I did tie that together Mm. to me. Um, the fact that Kenneth Branagh's character, Andre, is like omnicidal, wants to kill himself and everybody. Uh-huh. I saw that word was used on the Wikipedia for this movie. I was like, <laughs> that's pretentious, yeah, this but I'm looking that up. Um, I feel like that is just a, a necessary thing to have in the movie. Like how the people who live in the future who are facing existential climate change and they think maybe our only way to save ourselves is to actually just kill all humans back in time. Those people, they just need an agent back in time who's like, I'm down. I, I think it's. I think that to me is more central to the movie because they're they want their future and they're willing to kill an entire past to get their freedom for their future. Same with Kenneth Brown. He says it twice. If I can't have it, no one can. He says it to his wife and he says it about the universe. And there's also just like a lot of like 
uh, like you said, the fish out of water in the billionaire circles. Like he walks in with the Brooke Brothers suit and Michael Caine, which is a necessary part of a Christopher Nolan movie. Apparently, he's like that Brooke Brothers suit won't cut it. Yeah, we uh, need Riley here to do the perfect impression. Yeah, but yeah. When they, when it cuts to the back of Michael Caine's head, you're like, oh, of course, here <laughs> here he is. Man, that guy's getting old though. Man, his neck yeah. skin. <laughs> it's like no, Michael Caine. And did you notice that uh, the character's name is is Sir Michael something? Oh. And so they call him Sir Michael, yeah. like right in the movie. It's like a, a, it might be a nice send off. Like maybe he won't be in the next one. If maybe there, if there is another Christopher Nolan I th- movie, I think if he has opportunity, he'll put him in. I I like that scene because I feel like it it most characterized uh, the, the protagonist. That's actually his name. So, I, but I, okay, so two things. I think that they chose that the protagonist to kind of support your idea that he he's part of like that representation and that he doesn't get a name because he's the protagonist and he won't accentuate he's the protagonist. I think that but, if they were trying to feed in those plot points about like, uh, I'm the protagonist of the movie, I think I, my guess is that they didn't have him as the protagonist when they first initial drafts. He yeah, probably had a name, name yeah. and then they were trying to get these themes across and they were probably so on the nose that they said, we have to just fly in, into the face of this. We have to be so on the nose that he's just the protagonist. Uh, and that's just the only way it'll it'll work. Yeah, it is so jarring in the movie when they do it. Like, there's probably four times that he's like, "I'm the protagonist," yeah. and you're like, "What the fuck did you just say? <laughs> what the fuck did you just say?" It's a little like um, the writer on, on the script is the only credited writer is is Christopher Nolan's writer, and it's yeah. kind of like a writer writing in writery things to say. Like yeah. people in the real world don't know the word protagonist. Yeah, like, nobody says, says that. that. You like learned about it in high school and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, David, you said it perfectly. It's like jarring when you hear him say that. Uh, am I watching a movie? Is this yeah. like a cut of it? Or yeah, yeah it's very strange. I want to talk about the division of the movie. I think that the movie's kind of divided by the first time you see the inverter. Well, it's not the first time you see it, but the first time you understand what the inversion machine is, where you go on one side, you come out, and your time is inverted. And like that's the scene when Kenneth Branagh shoots his wife. Um, j- the protagonist is like tied down and then he does the flip and then the movie so you- you've got a, a red side of the room and a blue side of the room yeah. and red is current and blue is inverted past and they use those same colors yeah, later and that movie is a great or that scene is a great scene for posing a bunch of questions because they have the mask on and you're like wait what's going on is the mask the thing that allows him to go backwards and then he shoots his wife in reverse he has you sh- get introduced to the tool of when they speak backwards the, the forward people can hear yeah hey, what's up with that it was so weird to watch. Why is it that in that scene, before anyone goes through the turnstile, you've got the people on the red side of the room, uh, or the people on the blue side of the room are talking, and you hear it like, and then you just like hear a translation. Uh, he puts a device. He puts a device on that's like, and then you can still hear them talking inverted, but through the machine, you hear it forward. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and that's like a neat introduction, because they'll use that a bunch of times later. And I love that scene when, when like the military comes in, or the whatever, paramilitary comes in, and they're like, okay... Like, she's going to die if we don't go through. And then it's like, no, we have to go through. And then it's like, oh, shit, things are about to get so intense right now. He's going to go back, reverse time, and then we're going to go back through the movie. And so it's you be said so there crazy. was no moments that got you excited. That was the moment I was so excited. And then it never goes anywhere. And it's like, yeah, yeah this is all the stuff that I expected. Like, when you see the, the fight with himself in reverse, it was like, obviously, that was him. Like, why else would Robert Pattinson pull off a mask and be shocked if it wasn't one of those two? Like, there is no surprises after that. And I was so disappointed. I thought it was going to like expand into this like crazy thing, like like Interstellar's ending where I'm like, whoa, this is intense. This is cool. But there's never like, oh, it's just a bunch of reversed footage and then being like, hmm. Okay. Uh, kind of agree. Let's just take all of that stuff. Uh, let's just dwell on that moment. Yes. First, though, when yes. he walked out of the turnstile and everything was back and she's like, when you're running, you're going to feel the wind at your back. Yeah. That was all so cool. And yeah. as soon as those doors opened that he was re- inverted, I was like, oh, yes, yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. So this is cool. what we've been waiting yeah, for. Yeah, totally. I actually didn't really know that they were going to be sending people, like, inverting people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see the trailers. And there is some foreshadowing, like you talked about. Um, but for me, that was great. I was, It was like just amped up the stakes and everything. It was like, sweet. It's not just objects. Now this whole guy is inverted. That's so sick. What a cool concept. And then he walks out and like the... The puddle, like the water comes out of the puddle and back on his foot and stuff. Like, that's sweet. Um, but I will kind of agree with you that when we get to a lot of the set pieces, we have just seen that footage already and you know, just playing reverse and there's not too many surprises with it. Although, not completely. When they were in the original car chase and they see this car just like flipped over 
And they're like, oh, that's weird. And then when they go back in time and he's using all of that, that did work for yeah, me. Yeah, that is a cool reveal that it's his car that flips, but when he was in reverse, like, that's cool. Because in the first time you see it, you think that they're just weapons being used against them from, you know, like the Russian team. Actually, I don't want to make it national, but so Seder. Russian war, yeah. Seder's team. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I do agree with you that when he fought himself, I think it was actually the music. The music was really, like, placid in that scene. It, there, it wasn't very dynamic. And so it seemed like, um, like boring. It's like, yeah, we're just going to watch yeah. this play out because we know what happens. You know, yeah. yeah, the only thing I liked in reverse was like the reveal of like what that weird back crawl was. Because then the first yeah. time it's when it's in reverse, he does this back crawl. I'm like, that's so weird, like the exorcist, exorcist move. But the, And then when it plays, when he's inverted and it's playing in forward time, it's they're like, oh, he's just crawling back and it just looks weird in reverse. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool reveal. But all the flips and stuff, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I understood what it was the first time. And that yeah, the reveal that underneath the mask of the person he was fighting was John David Washington was like that's not a reveal. That was a reveal for me. Really? Really? Who did you think it was? So I knew I knew that they were going to be fighting themselves. I knew when okay. he took off the mask, I was like, oh, okay, that's obviously important. He's probably seeing himself. I thought Pattinson was seeing himself. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I did know like as soon as they were going back in time, I was like, oh yeah, the soldier he fought is obviously himself. But I didn't know that. Uh, Pattinson was actually looking at the protagonist yeah. and that, so it was still a, a bit of a oh that's cool that's fair and the fact that there's two of them at the same time because they're, they've gone through an inverter again so that yeah. kind of creates a split timeline that's that's fair yeah that was weird how, th- how that works so because in the trailers this is so weird in the trailers I'm, I'm pretty sure they say the line where Washington is like um, or no Patton says, says time travel and then Washington's like no no it's not time travel that's in the trailer right yeah, something. Like, I don't know. I think it is. And anyway, they put it in the movie, and I think some people are are thinking, like, this is not a time travel movie, technically. There's inverted objects, but there's no time travel. But that is not true. Because at f- basically, you go through the turnstile, and you're at the same moment of time as when you went in, but you're heading the opposite direction. And so the longer you live, the, the longer you stay there, the farther back into time you could go. And then if you invert yourself again, now I've, I'm back in time heading the same direction as everyone else. So you have just time traveled. So it yep. is definitely a time travel movie. Yeah. I think that maybe the reason that line is in the movie, A, for the trailers, like so people don't just go, oh, it's a time, time travel movie. movie. <laughs> and B, it, it almost foreshadows the fact that Robert Pattinson knows everything. And he's like trying to spoon feed it to the protagonist. He's like, is it time travel? And then the protagonist is like, nah. And he's yeah. like, God damn it, it is. I'm trying to tell yeah. you. <laughs> and it falls into all the time travel tropes like that the whole movie is sent to action by the protagonist later and he time travels back to like get it all. And like, it does all of that stuff uh, to no success for me. I, I saw you actually go like throw your hands up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, I you're like, you start a tenant. He's like, Oh yeah. David's, oh. David's wrist was actually like, <laughs> <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's a future um episode. That's literally the end of like men in black three. When he's like, I remember that there was a guy who came and saved me. And at the end he realizes, I was the one that saved me. And like, come on. That's just so overplayed. And uh, I don't know. I expect Christopher Nolan to elevate the material in some ways. Like, I think Inception could be a bad movie, but he elevates that material into something better. Uh, Dunkirk, he elevates war material that's overplayed into something better. And in this, he doesn't really elevate anything for me. There's some really cool stuff. Like, I like like having at the beginning how they reveal like the bullets are inverted and he like catches it and stuff. I think that's how he elevates it. But then... The more I thought about it, the more I'm like, it's really inconsistent. Like, so it's willpower that lets the object know that it should act in reverse. Yeah, I like, have a question about that, actually, because I was I was a little bit confused. She said, OK, think about you dropping it and then it'll go back into your hand. So then throughout the movie, I'm like when he's in the art storage facility and he sees the bullet holes in the glass and the gun laying there, I'm like, can't he just pick up the gun and then imagine him yeah, getting shooting the bullets? That's a great question. Right. Because When she explains it to him, it seemed to me that he can basically just like if you if you say say the something's on the floor, if I just go like I tripped then suddenly it's as if I dropped it and I can it can go whoop, mm. right back into my hand. Um, but then as you say, he like, couldn't he have done that? Because throughout the movie, it kind of seems more like something actually happened to put it there. Like someone actually had to take a gun and shoot it and, and put that there. And then when those events play again, that's when it'll come back out. And you can't just will things to come back out. Yeah. So which is it? I'm not clear on that. Right? 
I, yeah, yeah that, that's one of the reasons why my rating is a little lower, just because I was confused by the concept a bit. Yeah. But I, I don't know, going back to the whole, like, I'm just insecure, um, I feel like I haven't completely gotten the mechanics of this movie yet. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, if you ask me a random question about Inception, I can be like, yeah, this is exactly how it works. And I can I know the internal logic of it. Whereas this, I, I don't know it fully. Like and so I'm worried that, like, there are answers to this question. Someone else who maybe saw it twice or had subtitles or just understood it all could be like, oh, no, it works like this. I think there absolutely is some answers, but I think there is, like, dumb stuff that just happens like the like, car yeah and like there's I, I wrote them down but i wrote it in my handwriting in the dark so i can't re read any of my notes but there's i think to me what signals that this movie isn't like as elevated as i want it to be is that the first half of the movie is just like four or five conversations of like i need your help i can't help you i have the secret code i'll help you now and there's like four or five of these these stupid conversations where it's like tell me the code i can't tell you oh wait you said this thing now I can help you and it's like okay yeah this is like boring spy stuff but like really repetitive and boring and simple and it's lame and like all the all the time travel reveals of like oh that person that he he saw in the met in the future oh he's already met her and she already knows him that's why he helped her and like it's just stuff I've seen a hundred times before in like really shitty time travel movies and it doesn't feel like he did anything super interesting outside of having really good cinematography good visual effects good score good lighting and it, like that's the Nolan touch, but in terms of like taking time travel and making it mind expanding, there's nothing there. I don't know. I thought it was so original, the inverting thing when he when he first like picked up that bullet and they explained how that works. I was like, that is so cool. I've never seen that before. For sure, but that's like used twice, and like yeah, it's just it's not used at the end. Like that's not how they win at the end. It's how they how he wins at the end is the guy who's his friend has to go kill himself because he was time traveling and goes and opens the door and back reverse. You're and right stuff. that there was never a moment in the movie where like someone's on top of the protagonist with a knife, like really close to his eye. And he has to like, Oh, there's a bullet on the wall that I, I can do this thing. And then the audience is like, Oh, you can use it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, okay. So time, the, every object is like plays out in reverse. And so the artifact is an inverted object. So what, what if he just like, when you mean he, the, the algorithm? Guy, yeah. The algorithm. What if he just dropped it and he can just will it back up and be like, oh, in my head, I dropped it. So and catches it like there's just stupid stuff like that, that they don't explain enough how the willpower integrates into it. And did, yeah. it, did anyone at this table understand what was going on with that? Um, the building being dem demolished twice. No, I had the same question. Was it just a cool stunt or was there a purpose? I think there was somebody in it or somebody <laughs> under it that they were trying to save. And then blow it up again. I don't. I it was weird yeah, for me. Yeah, there was a lot of those like cool time travel explosions. I think the only one that really worked for me is when the person's like running and their friend's like no, and then you see the reverse explosion happen and it sucks them into the wall and they like get kind of stuck in the wall and you're like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. That was like the one I was like, that sucks. But the double explosion in the end, the point is to blow up the building. Why does? Exploding it once, unexploding it, re-exploding it help with that? The, it doesn't. Again, I, I believe there's an answer for that, but that was just that like um, peak. I don't know what's happening <laughs> for yeah. me in the movie. Like that, the amount of times the information is given to you when people have masks on, and even at the beginning yeah. of this movie, I was like, God, why does Nolan do this to us yeah. every time? Yeah, that 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 end sequence really fell flat for me. Where like it's a military assault, and it's 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 a really cool idea to have this pincer assault where there's one group that's set in reverse and will start an hour later and one group that's going forward and then they're bringing this military operation together and like that's the whole tactic is they're they're intertwined and you double your forces totally it's great it's a brilliant no it's it's separate people it's oh, yeah cuz like Robert Pattinson's right, part of the inverted true. um but in the end it's just like okay we're getting a helicopter like we're we're getting helicopters there we're getting double yeah like there's the troops and they just like run up a hill up to machine gun nests and are just like, burp, 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 burp. and it's just a really, it's a shame because Christopher Nolan's done an excellent war film and that's a terrible war sequence. It's like a really shitty fight and it was like not well choreographed and like a lot more people would be dead running up these hills to machine guns. Like it's poorly thought out. He does have a penchant for really cool vehicles, though. That Hummer with the digital camel <laughs> yeah. on it was so, that was pretty like sweet. so stubby. I was like, I love that car. <laughs> 
Yeah, but like there was only small explosions other than the building <laughs> yeah. falling. And I was like, it's kind of cool, but I couldn't get over this. This is like so Gen Z of me to say, but there's a reverse filter on Snapchat. And I was like, this whole movie is just like somebody recorded and then reversed it, which totally. is exactly what they're going for. But it, I just couldn't get past oh, that totally. like inner uncomfortable uncanny valley feeling of like this is wrong this shouldn't be happening i think if this movie came out 30 years ago it would have wowed audiences but i think that no one's gonna be like holy crap that bird's flying in reverse holy shit like all the smoke's going into itself oh gosh well that's not the amazing part of it but there are still moments where you think like wow i wonder how they did film this like when they're running through um to get back uh, through the hole that the plane has made when it's crashing the building and all the firemen are sh- shooting their hoses and like did they just uh i guess they just like cleared a path and then just do a match frame and film again probably and he walks yeah it's probably like a robot and, like dolly or whatever and it just matches the stuff yeah but i thought those were all cool and of course in typical christopher nolan fashion he had to get a full 747 and actually crash it yeah that's uh, pretty cool that was wicked but it wasn't <sighs> <laughs> it wasn't as cool as it could have been because like when you think about how cool like a plane crashing into a terminal could be it just i don't know that sequence didn't really do anything for me i like that they went out of their way to make sure that they're like, not killing those people like thank goodness they're such good guys um then they drop the gold bars off so that they can create a distraction i guess but then it just like runs into the terminal and it doesn't really do much and like i don't know like they, they set it up that the first time that john david's character gets sucked out you kind of think that he went into the turbine or whatever uh and then you find out that that just it didn't and that's it that's the payoff that's, 100%. that's, that's the plane i was gonna say i was on the edge of my seat during that scene i'm like something big and exciting is gonna yeah. happen and then they just kind of cruise into the building yeah. there's like one or two explosions yeah. beside it i'm like eh. also that shutter door is not secure and if that's like their most secure vault that's a terrible vault. That's a, <laughs> such a shitty door for that vault. And like, that's just a poor thinking. They're like, okay, we need it to be able to be like accessible from like one wall on the outside. Uh, and it needs to be able to pull for the turbine so our sequence works. Okay, yeah, it's got to be a shutter door. Okay, yeah, that's fine. What's a shutter door? Is uh, this it's because like you the, play Rainbow Six Siege? No, 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 no. It's just like the door that goes like, <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> thin pieces of metal and it's it's dislodged. And like, that's the one that is like blowing oh, in the Oh, that wind. door, yeah. And like, that's their most secure airtight vault. That like they can push air out of in 10 seconds to like stop fires. It locks down. It's super secure. It's one wall from the outside and it's paper thin metal. It's not secure. That's just a terrible. That's just not well thought out. Mm hmm. I like the idea of I like these um, cool things that exist in the real world that he put in, uh, namely the free ports and the like, what are they called? Lone cities. Those random Soviet cities that are just like oh, forgotten yeah. that was cool. nuclear ghost towns. I, I like when there's cool things that you can go off and read about later. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I do like how they set up that villain. I think that's cool that he was just a kid doing like cleanup work and then the future knew who he would become because they're the future and so they send back this one thing and like immediately he sees it and kills the other people to get control of it. That's kind of weird though because the whole movie, the, the, there's always time travel paradoxes and stuff and I think Nolan's read enough of the comments on his own previous movies to know that, <laughs> like where they are. So in this movie, they're just like, hey, let's just like fly right into this and say... That's unknowable, and that's a paradox, yeah. and who cares? And don't pay too much attention to it. But it seems like they actually do take a stance, and the stance is it's it's a loop where everything is set. Like, that's already happened in the past. They say repeatedly, like, what's done is done. So how could it be, then, that they the people in the future send something back to the past, and, like, when, when the young uh, Sador opens up that case, his name is on it, on the paper, so it's... They are they are affecting the past. They they say it in the movie. They like they do the Austin Powers look at the camera like, yeah, that goes for you too. Don't think about it too hard. It's they have a couple of those dialogues where like yeah this yeah this this world grandfather paradox. Just don't think about it. Just then just why let do it they happen. lean into the what's done is done? Because they've told you to turn off your brain and they expect that there's so much garble that's happened at you that your brain can't even handle more information at that point and you're just like oh, okay sure whatever whatever you want Christopher Nolan I'm, I submit. Because it seems like they are taking a stance and it's like everything that has happened will always happen. You don't really have free will and, you know, the fight that it, with yourself is going to play out. You're going to try to shoot yourself, even though it's like you could just be like, hey, it's, it's me. This will make sense. So, yeah. Yeah. And oh, the rule. So, like, OK, if you they set up the rule, if you touch yourself, you'll implode. But like they never used it. They never use it. And like 
he does touch himself. But, like, well, he, he has clothes on, but like clothes. on an, like a, a nuclear time travel atomic scale, are clothes the ultimate protection? Well, yeah, I think so. I think it's like if your atoms come in contact with your atoms, then they're gonna negate each other. So I can I can buy the fact that there's yeah, no but, that the clothes are a sufficient barrier. I buy that. What I don't like is introducing this thing that's like, wow, that sounds like that's gonna really suck. Yeah. I can't wait to see, see that it, later in the yeah. movie. And then they never have someone totally. just go into yeah, a void. That would have yeah, been yeah. sick. I was expecting like a looper thing. Like in Looper, when you find out when the people try and run from their fate, they go back in time and then slowly torture them so that in the present time they're like falling apart in real time. Like their nose is cut off and their hands are like their fingers are slowly falling off. And it's this awful sequence that's really cool and i was expecting yeah something like that where you're like you're gonna find out how bad it is to mess with the rules of time and it's like no because they needed that they needed that to to to, to accentuate how bad a time nuke is because like the time yes. nuke is just like this unknowable thing that just like the the stupid henchman why does he go with this end of the world thing that's so stupid this un like the yeah, this the bald un like mute henchman is just like i'm gonna blow up the universe um like, we need to understand how bad that is. We would have yeah. internalized the stakes totally. if we saw a person just it, get just totally evaporated. And it was awful. P pain, like, suffering, like, straight into hell. <sighs> exactly. <laughs> That's what Sarah wants. <laughs> <laughs> I want pain. No. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to mention. Um, oh, okay. In the fight scene in the art storage facility, um, why doesn't... Uh, protagonist reveal himself to himself. I think because he they had told him that like you shouldn't make contact with yourself, and so he was trying to just like get away. I guess because he said he would like. I mean, in the beginning, we anticipate him doing something uh, to protect somebody else, since the reason that he is um, recruited to be a part of Tenet um, is because he was willing to kill himself to save somebody else. Um, and then you go into this fight scene. If he really wanted to save Kat, why wouldn't he just reveal himself to himself in order to save her, right? Um, and then I also want to mention with that fight scene, I totally anticipated it because you see him like fight off so many people so powerfully and you, and you can tell that he's smart yep. and you can tell that he's strong. And then when it comes to him fighting himself, the first time there's like more like, and I like that level of power for sure. That I makes like, sense. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, why is this masked henchman such a hard foe for me to get through, right? Yeah, exactly. He, he really sold his athletic and his totally. ability as an action star yeah. in this movie. The kitchen fight is the best. And it's not just that he's using cool moves and like cheese graters and stuff like that. For me, it was he really had his own, I guess, voice in the combat where he had a real rhythm to it. The, the pacing of... He would like attack a guy... Um, but really take his time between strikes. There was like some breathing room where he just had this really awesome pace and rhythm that was all his own. I yeah. was like, man, this yeah. this is some really cool it's action. It's really cool because like it starts and there's like he's surrounded and he kind of like disposes of them quick. But then it's kind of one by one and he has time to just like kind of go back to a normal walk and then throw a bunch of dishes right at the moment and then like strike, strike, strike. And it was sick. It was a good fight. That was fantastic. And and uh, John David Washington is a great action star and he did a lot of his own stunts as That's well. That's really cool. And yeah, I hope he I hope he has a long, lustrous career of this. Because yeah. like, I wasn't sure about him at first. I've only really seen him in, in Black Klansman. And he's more goofy in, yeah. in that And he role. does the white voice and stuff. Yeah, and it's just kind of a I really like movie. So I, I love that movie, though. I, I, it's a great movie. I just wasn't sure that he could Fair. pull off this tone, but he totally yeah. did. He, yep. he has like a witty undertone, too. I mean, a great example of this is when he's sitting at the dinner table with Andre. And Andre's like, are you sleeping with my mom? <laughs> <laughs> are you sleeping with my wife and he's like not yet yeah <laughs> or when that waiter is like oh I'll, i will uh i'll go get the server for you i'm the host i'll get the server and he's like no just pass on the order yeah i love that yeah, shit like totally. that, that characterization was great yeah i love that he's out of his element but he's also just like comfortable he's just like yeah whatever he's having i'll have one of those and he's like oh yeah box it up and he's <laughs> like i will not <laughs> there's some good jokes in this movie did okay, you guys haven't seen the kingsman right I have. You I've have? watched both of them, actually. Did it strike you as weird that the initiation into Tenet is exactly the same as The Kingsman? Yes, it's very similar. Yeah. So in The Kingsman, when they've done all their training... Is this a Kingsman spoiler? Yeah, it's pretty early in the movie. And if you haven't seen yeah. it, it's a 10-year-old movie. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> they get brought to a train yard and are tortured and are like put in front of a train. And they're like, tell us who the Kingsmen are. Tell us who the Kingsmen are. And if you don't tell them... 
you're saved and then you become a Kingsman. You have to go get a nice suit. You have to like kind of, there's other like little details. I can't, I wrote them down, but I can't read my own writing. Uh, other little details that are like very similar to the Kingsman movies. Uh, and I found it so weird. Well, it's it's just the 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 arena of possibilities for British filmmakers is just so narrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need Michael Caine in every single movie because he's also in the Kingsman. <laughs> <laughs> um, another cool thing is kind of getting to see how Neil is already familiar with the protagonist, how he already knows him. I mean, at the beginning in the orchestra scene, um, you see the red yeah. uh, dangly thing on his bag. Um, and so you're like, oh, better watch out for that. We're going to get to know that character. And then when they sit down the first time that they're meeting in India and Neil is like, oh, a diet Coke for him and a vodka soda for me. And protagonist is like, I prefer soda water. And Neil's like, "Mm." no, you don't. (laughs) Because he knows him already. But what's fantastic about that scene is that we don't question, like we don't think, huh, maybe this guy's a time traveler. We just... Nolan here is leaning into the genre where it's a spy movie where everybody's really competent. So yeah. we, as the audience, assume, oh, it's just his job to know everything because he's a spy guy. Of course, he's done his homework. He's read your dossier. He knows everything about you. That is a great use of the genre. Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah. I really like that uh, opening scene in the orchestra. This is a great example of like uh, what we talked about in previous episodes where there's an ordinary thing. We talked about this most in the Prestige episode. An ordinary thing made extraordinary, mm. which is all these people in stadium seating in the crowd, uh, but they're all knocked out and you can climb on them. Yeah. That was such an awesome image. I like that scene, but I also was like, again, could be gory or like, I want Inglorious <laughs> Bastards Tarantino I, like yeah, in the theater totally. burning like You're people. Yeah, nobody, nobody died in that scene, it felt like. No, it was just like... Anybody. There were some people was in the there? crowd who got knocked. Yeah, okay, killed, my yeah. question... What was the point of it? What what was he? Who was the guy he was rescuing? They were they were actually collecting one piece of the algorithm there, yes. but their mission oh, failed. Yeah, and Sator was able to procure that piece. Yeah, yeah, okay, again. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then of course that introduces us to like the inverse bullets and also Neil. So it it kind of helped with the plot development, but at the same time, I kind of feel the same as you. Is like what was happening? I don't really what, know. Well, I actually thought when they are uh, going back in time in the later part of the movie and you see that uh, you see the ships on the water going backwards and you see the windmill again I'm like oh my god it's Tenet it's a palindrome the whole movie is a palindrome we're gonna end the final battle final scene is gonna be the first that scene so I was sick. hoping that would happen but it actually didn't happen I guess ah yeah I think that would have been a way cooler ending and such a better payoff because like the random in the middle of the desert hills fight means nothing it's like it's so abstract and like s- surreal almost the buildings yeah. even the architecture and stuff it kind of had the same production design aesthetic as interstellar's uh, robots yeah it's really kind of square. just blocky. it just reminds me of like uh, batman versus superman where they go fight on an unoccupied island because they need to have blow up buildings but they don't want to have collateral damage and it just felt like that where i was like i don't i don't even see the enemy right now i don't see people dying i'm just in this abstract fight that means nothing that's supposed to raise the stakes and there's an abstract time nuke that I have no idea what it's actually going right, to do. Right, so the stakes are grave, but they're invisible and abstract. Yeah. They're, you're holding them in your mind rather yeah. than seeing them. But that idea of making the final showdown that heist, and then all of a sudden he's facing off against like the police at the beginning or like some some reversal of those stakes, and that's like the final showdown for this time nuke, that would have been way cooler. Yeah, I didn't feel worried for the end of the no, world. I was like, they have this super intricate nuclear device that will literally end the world and they're just gonna have it in this desert completely random i would have loved to see it like under a city or something you see these people just living their normal lives and you're like the the world's gonna end these people aren't gonna exist anymore like i don't know it was so random for them to place it there especially after there's so many chains changes of scenery and, and so many different places that are like the city life we've got india we've got um where else Mm. northern uh, nordic places like oslo and yeah yeah. exactly estonia yeah Yeah, italian yeah um what was the deal with if you go back and like why in the first scene is the protagonist there who is he an operative working for at that point he wakes up from the coma and they're kind of like it was a test but i don't think that means the mission you were on was a test. I think he worked for some agency and was legitimately trying to get this item. Yeah. But what would he have thought that item was? And 
was he putting himself like if he's the orchestrator of Tenet, is he putting himself in that mission or is he intervening after that mission? I think I think it's probably him that set up this whole thing and he's part of some weird paramilitary thing that is orchestrated to get, have him go in. But really, the only way to have him fully become the man he's supposed to be is not know all the details isn't there like a weird code word that he says when he goes up into that? Yeah, they room they thing? say like the twilight, yeah. dusk kind of code. There's word a lot there. of code. Yeah. And what's really weird is um, when he they breach this like booth, like where rich people watch the opera, and there's a person in there who's like, "But I've already made contact." He says something cryptic like that. Do you guys remember yeah, that? Yeah. And I was like, "That's gonna be a thing. What's that gonna be?" And it never, never really came back around unless I totally missed totally. it. Totally, and I, I have questions for stuff like that where like I just don't get it. Like the the other thing that I, I totally missed, I guess, was when was there two wives? <laughs> when did that start? Because at the end, there's like there's two of her because there's the one that's still in love with the husband, and then there's the one that hates him. She she mentions when she's pulling up to the boat with her son, she sees somebody diving off the side of the boat and she's like, I envy her because I wish I had her freedom. She thought that the lady jumping off the boat was having an affair with her husband. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Too. And then so she stopped having feelings for her husband mm. after that. That's why she has such like a rocky relationship with him. And I'd love to get more into Kat because I feel like even though she her main responsibility in this movie is to care about her son. Whoa. <laughs> Which was so, so annoying. Like when they're like, the whole world's gonna end. So and she's like, care about does that but include my son? My son? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. I would have loved to see her in the place of her husband yeah. and her husband switch because totally. she would have been such a badass she's like sick. antagonist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that pissed me off. I'm like, your son, your son? It, okay, I get, I, I don't have a kid, obviously, so I don't know what it's like to have that bond with a kid but at the same time I'm like the only thing she ever talks about is how she can't see her son and yeah. that she wants to see her son she was kind of one note in that way although it did it was good and bad like the first time you see her she's hugging her kid uh, at the, outside the school and you're like oh, okay cool likable she's a mom but then the kid gets put into a car and drives away without her and you're like oh that's weird why why doesn't she get to go with the kid? And so that's all good. Um, it increases her likability very quickly. And, you know, she has this skin in the game. And we understand her motivations. But it just got a little like, beaten a dead horse yeah. when the fate of the like universe is at stake. Does that include my son dying? It was like, <laughs> yeah, lady, and a lot more. Yeah. She's so weak, too, like in the sense of when a protagonist is in the kitchen where she thinks he's being killed. Um, she's like tearing up and stuff. I'm like, for someone who has such a badass husband or somebody who, you know, kills a lot of people, you seem kind of like you care too much. Well, like, I guess she kind of needed to be like that because she needs to, over the course of the movie, summon the courage to confront her husband. Um, but another kind of weird plot hole thing is like she is not supposed to kill her husband because if he dies the bomb goes off but then on the boat she selfishly is like you know what i'm gonna kill you and then she reveals to protagonist i knew you'd find a way like i just took the whole galaxy's <laughs> yeah. chances here that like these other guys i'm not in contact with are gonna find a way to make this okay for me to rage kill my husband okay <laughs> The only time where I felt her um, and her kids relationship uh, actually was important throughout the movie is at the end when she does kill her husband finally and you see her uh, leaving to go to the boat where her kid is and you're finally like, okay, she has her freedom back. She has her kid back. She has her life back. And that's all you've been waiting for the whole movie. That's all protagonist is working for. Really? He doesn't care too much about the end of the world because he's willing to go back and save her versus going to save the world um but he ends up doing both obviously did you guys ever get the sense that neil is max that neil is cat's son oh i thought i thought for a second the reveal because they they hide the husband's face i thought that the reveal might be that that's robert Pat robert pattinson i thought it was gonna be the husband not the son what do you mean? Uh, so they show one scene when she's explaining how bad the relationship is of the side of the face of the husband on her. And like you can see things aren't good. And so I thought the reveal was going to be that her husband is Robert Pattinson. So you thought this earlier in the movie before they had. Yeah, I wrote Kenneth it down. I was, like, I was like, is this what's going on? And I'm way wrong. So I did not. And I do not get any 
any hint that uh, Neil is Max. Um, but some people all online think that he is. Oh. They think that because of Neil's behavior, because Neil kind of says, we need to save her in the here and now. And she care- he cares about that her a lot, that um, that's her kid for some reason. And, they, and I actually saw a really contrived thing, in my <laughs> opinion, that was like, yeah, Max. Maximilian. Apparently, there's a apparently there's a variation of the name Maximilian that kind of has the word Neil in it, and then they thought that it could be Neil for short or something. And I was like, come on! If if, if he wanted to go to those lengths, he would have named Neil like Sasha and Max Alexander yeah. or some kind of like yeah. it's short for this. That's Richard not too Dick, obvious. Yeah. That feels like a stretch, a bit. Total stretch. <laughs> I like the idea though, but yeah, more time travel tropes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Back to the music, uh, not in regards to it being too loud, but uh, there was so many moments where I was like, this music doesn't make sense for this scene. And I wonder if they kind of um, made the music so it sounded reversed or something, but it was just so weird. I uh, they, they had like the main theme playing backwards. Hmm. Was, was is it by things. Hans Zimmer? No, it is uh, uh, Ludwig Göransson. Yeah, it's. I didn't find myself distracted by the score, but I also never found myself like compelled by it. It was just like, yeah, it's a score. Uh, yes, yeah, s- similar. I recognized the main theme. Like there was a time where it started, and I'm like, oh, we're back to the main theme, and it's kind of yeah. kind of cool. But I wasn't like this score. Is yeah, sick. it's not like Inception or something where you're like, ooh, or like Interstellar, even better, where you're yeah. like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're traveling through space, guys. <laughs> yeah, no oohs and ohs yeah. this time. Just kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I think that this falls into the B tier of Christopher Nolan movies. I think that my final answer for score and your final answer for score will fall somewhere in between. Not music score, but no, out, yeah, out, out, of like, score? out of ten score, where you'll you'll be like, okay, yeah, there is more holes than I originally saw, and I'll be like, oh, there is more explanations than I originally saw, and like we'll find kind of some middle ground. And I think like it'll be the less popular little brother of Inception long term. Yeah, on on in some ways, it feels like. Inception for 2020 like it's it's an awesome successor and Inception seems Inception and the Prestige and, and Interstellar seem so basic and straightforward compared to this um, but in other ways I really don't anticipate it having the cultural impact people aren't going to use uh, tenant as a verb like they do with Inception um, I'd be surprised it's too this, opaque yeah, it's this, too opaque for that I think this will do like less than Dunkirk money is my prediction Inception just nailed the perfect level of of um hard to follow but compelling and intriguing but you're you're digesting it and you're walking out of the theater like wow my mind is expanded whereas this is probably goes a little too far and again especially if you can't understand what's being said that you're it's like it's cool but like don't take your parents to see this no do not take your parents to see this movie yeah they will hate it yeah i expect that there'll be a decade's worth of super hardcore fans that come up with really contrived explanations for everything and they'll be like there is no plot hole there is no mistakes everything is thought out but like really it's going to be a combo of both it's it's gonna be like inception where like if you think about it too hard there's some holes but it's still a really cool idea and there's really cool moments and there's there's definitely it's definitely worth watching well there's things in his movies where this could not unless this happens perfectly there's no way that this <laughs> this whole set piece would happen. Like, there's things like that in The Dark Knight. Like, oh, it's a good thing that uh, Joker somehow knows what address to send this finger to, so that <laughs> yeah. You know, there's just there's just things like that. But it, it kind of doesn't matter. There's casualties in his movies for like if he wants to have this level of complexity and build this crazy world and get that information to you in two hours that there's casualties and like characterization is a casualty of that and like convenient things falling into the character's laps is another uh, result of that as well. Um, Did you guys find the editing at the beginning of the movie was kind of shoddy? Like I just found there was some cuts where I was like, this feels off. Like they just cut it too soon. Um, An example of that would be once they come down off of that building in India and they just kind of like rip, their yeah. their zip line or their their um, bungees yeah their bungees off uh, and then they and then it cuts and then they're somewhere else you <laughs> see them I was like that's so into the crowd a little bit then that shot don't you you see him kind of like oh now I'm I'm lost in the crowd for like a second I don't recall I think that I mean that was the one that I kept in my head because there was a few um, I think another was during the train scene after um, the Russian guy switches the clock and then it cuts. 
What was the deal with that clock switching thing? Is that just I supposed to be like a like a foreshadowing? Like we're getting we're throwing time into the mix here. I didn't really get that. Yeah, I can't, I can't he said it. something like most people last X amount of hours before they break. And oh yeah, that'll be at seven o'clock for you when people give up. I think it's for yeah you. to to bring in the element of time. Yeah, yeah. it's such a weird placement. Ugh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, my problem with the editing was just in the especially the first half. It feels so long. I was so bored watching this movie. Oh, I was. I was so like okay. It lulled for me when they're on the boat when he when protagonist is on the boat with Sator after they. And come to think of it, what the hell was the point of this scene where, they, where they're on those like fancy racing boats? Oh, I was yeah. saying, what were they doing? It's. It, I think it's just to have her almost kill the husband, but you find out that he actually needs him alive, and then uh, kind of, kind of push the plot forward a little bit and have them reveal their intentions, play their play their hands a time. For bit. sure, but what were they ostensibly doing? Like having they, fun. They have diving. They were just suits, vibing. But they had diving suits on. <laughs> yeah, he says diving. Know. I'm like, what are they gonna? Are they gonna dive down to some nuclear crap? Like what? What I think they they're just doing? doing rich people stuff, rich people fun stuff. I thought he was going to go try to steal something. Or no. <laughs> I don't know. It was weird. But it was after that when they're just like hanging out on his ship where I was like, this is slowing down now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I think the first half, this, yeah, there's the switch with the red and blue room where you kind of get another layer of time travel. That's when the movie picks up a little bit for me. There's still stupid shit and it never pays off. But the first half, when it's all the like fake espionage stuff. And it's just a bunch of conversations about people that you haven't met yet. And it's like, oh, she will be doing this and he's doing this because of this. And that's happening because of this. And this is happening because of this. So like, who are these people and why the fuck do I care? And there's so many scenes of that. Like Michael Caine gives you like four minutes of like talking about their relationship and their dynamic of the wife and Andre. And like that could have been condensed into a shot. That could have been like, okay, I see them like not kiss. She tries to kiss him and she turns away. Like there's so many other ways. There actually was a lot of depth there that turned out to be immaterial. Like the, he spent a lot of time pounding the audience with like, okay, there's this artist. He makes forgeries. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're really good fakes. He made two of them. One got sold to this guy. He's using it as blackmail because she was close to that artist. But yeah. That artist also was in a wheelchair or something. <laughs> like there's just like all of this. Yeah, and it's like, so long. I yeah. found it kind of interesting. It was, was happening because I think my brain was just in the mode of like, you must absorb everything. This will all be important later. Like I need to like, get all of this or else I'm going to miss crap. And maybe at some point I got exhausted and, and I actually didn't need to follow all that. It didn't really matter. Yeah. I think that they could have just editorialized this movie a little bit. Cause like there's, there's the seeds of really cool things, but I think they needed to take those seeds, let it grow into something different and then prune it from what it is into a specific shape. Cause it just feels like it's kind of underdeveloped to me. It felt to me, I walked out of the theater thinking, I think this is a four act movie because I know that um, Dark Knight is a four act movie. Mm. David S. Goyer says that uh, he has a story to credit and, and you can feel that as the audience because what happens is Joker's defeated, Two-Faced, Two-Face is created and you're like, oh, Batman 3 with Two-Face, that's going to be nuts. And then there's another half an hour of the movie where Joker's already defeated and Two-Face just um, plays out some stuff and then eventually dies. S- spoiler alert for Dark Knight. Um <laughs> That is, you can feel that as the audience. And I thought that that was going on with this movie. But when I sat back and looked at all the plot points and stuff, I, I think this is just a th- three act movie that seems long. Yeah. There are a lot of like little things that messes with time. Like when they're on the boat and the helicopter comes in with the gold bars and like four of the crewmates. Oh, yeah. And you're kind of like, oh, okay, those are the gold bars that came out of the plane. Um, but we know. Uh, protagonist and Kat are on the boat with Andre and then Andre beats the guy with the gold bar and you're like okay obviously those were his gold bars I mean those are the gold bars that came originally when he finds the the piece of the weapon as a young man and he there's a paper on it with his name on it there's gold in there too and that's why he's rich like that's why he's set up as a rich person yeah so I think those are the original gold I think that's not from the airport scene oh Oh, yeah is it inverted gold or is it just regular gold to get him set up I think he does like oh yeah he does catch yeah he does that but then he gives one to Andre and it's not inverted (laughs) I don't know does anyone know why getting shot by an inverted thing hurts more is worse I want, I, is it because of the time element or is it just because the shape of the bullet? Because like a forward bullet is sharp, so it it 
kind of creates its its kind of avenue, whereas a flat back of a bullet it's just more blunt. It's just more blunt. So I don't know if it's. I that? think the time element is definitely involved in it. Like you can't inverse an already inversed bullet, something along those lines. Maybe. That's what I got from it. I would it. love to do a second part to this podcast where I see the movie two more times yeah. and have the answers. To all Honestly, I might have a completely different opinion. I think I will like it more on repeat viewings, but I do think it's a failure of the movie to not explain itself properly for the first watch. Yeah, this is a really interesting point. Like, if you have to, I think we talked about this a little bit in previous episodes, but like if you have to watch a movie multiple times, is that a strength or a weakness? Like the fact that you get more out of something on repeat viewings and there's layers, I like that there's depth. Like I can watch a Kubrick movie a million times. I'm always going to get more. Um, I think the question comes down to, well, how much do you get on the first view? Do you get enough on the first view? Because if you don't feel like you got enough to appreciate what the intentions of the filmmaker were on the first viewing, then that's a failure. Yeah. And I think I think it'll be split. I think if if you're someone who's really liked everything Nolan's done, you like the prestige, you like Inception, despite like the flaws that you might see, I think you'll like this. And I think you'll like it enough the first time that you'll want to keep going. But if you're someone like me that has a hard time buying in buying in past those plot holes and the kind of stupid ideas to see the good stuff, you might not. And I, I would say like if you're like me, it's not worth watching. But I don't know. And if you're the type of person who liked Inception and then thought the last half hour had too much action, buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. For me, the first time I watch a movie, every time I just want to be so involved in it and I want to enjoy every single aspect of it. And then second time around, I know what to look for. Mm -hmm. I know like I want to pick up all of those little Easter eggs, all of the things that I didn't catch in the first movie. Um, but I think for the first time watching it, I would say it's worth it. There's a lot of action. It keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time. Obviously, it's not like intense action like I would like, but um, <laughs> Need more it, it was good enough. It was good enough. <laughs> now, throw into the mix that you might be risking your life getting coronavirus if you go see it. It's no. still yeah. worth watching. Wait till it's on uh, streaming. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. It, I, it's a movie that you want to pause, that you want to yeah. rewind, that you want subtitles. to. Yeah, you want subtitles. All of those kind of I'm things. I'm really tempted to go to the theater and see it again because I sure. really liked it. But uh, am I going to get that much more out of it because there's no subtitles? Am I just going to miss the same crap again? I might. I think, though, you'll like have a better idea of what scenes are important and when you can kind of really focus and when you can kind of just disengage and be like, I right, whatever, time travel movie stuff. At what point did Robert Pattinson take over Hollywood? Yeah. What the hell? It's crazy. That's cr it went from being like, hey, isn't that the guy from Twilight <laughs> yeah. to being like, I'm Batman. Yeah. yeah. I, I <laughs> he's think in the, everything the and best, he's awesome. The best move he ever did was like openly having disdain for Twilight, even in its like Twilight promo interviews being like, I hate this. This is like the worst thing ever because like it made people be like, OK, maybe he's not just Edward. Maybe he's like a little bit more. And then he's slowly built up. He's been in like everything. And yeah. Now he's Batman. And he's just he's almost like. um. Uh, who plays Gordon in Batman? Um, Gold, Gary Oldman. Yeah, Gary Oldman. Uh, he's almost like a chameleon. Yeah. Like when you see him, you're like, hey, huh. isn't that Robert Pattinson? But then he's just a totally different character. And he's chosen these roles that are kind of understated. Like the guy in the lighthouse. Like who's playing that guy? I don't know. He's got a... Who knows? Or like um, the guy in... Uh, he played um, Good Time. Yeah. And like who even saw that movie? You know, Not a lot, but it's he's made great career moves and Centric i think he's degree. very competent and i'm i'm happy to see him everywhere and i, I think that he's a really good decision for batman because he's so different from what we've seen before he's a lot younger he's got like a younger appeal like he has the messy hair and the eyeliner and stuff uh and i think that that's a good direction to take that movie did you like him in this movie yeah, I thought he was pretty good. I thought in the beginning his acting was kind of weird. And I love Robert Pattinson. Like, he's he's in Good Time. He's in The Lighthouse, which are both A24 movies. Um, but yeah, I, I his uh, his acting was kind of awkward um, the first time you see him on screen. But then afterwards I got used to it. And I was like, oh, okay, this is good. I found myself being like, uh, is that his actual accent? Or is he American trying to do... No, he's British. He's British. Yeah, yeah. so... So maybe that was my way of internalizing that I'm on your same page and think and the acting was weird, but I, I thought he was good in this movie. And he, he actually, going back to actually the narrative thrust of the movie, he could have been the protagonist. We, we talk a lot on this podcast about people, all the side characters acting as if they're the star of their own movie, and he totally could have been. And at the end, when he gives that speech about to the protagonist about how they've been on many adventures together, you're kind of like, 
oh, I want to imagine all those adventures. I want to see, I want to see the Robert Pattinson, like the Neil movie. Yeah. Th- that should never it's get funny. made. It should never, ever be made. No, 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 no. But in my mind, you know, I'm like, oh, that's, that's great. And I like the character enough that I want to see that. It's funny. I, I, I imagined in the scene when they have the, uh, the algorithm and they're spinning it apart, I imagined like the post-apocalypse movie that's like set 10,000 years in the future where it's like a, it's like a fantasy movie set in like a dystopian future, like a post-apocalypse future where they have to go on like a fantasy quest to get all the algorithm together so they can change the past. Dude, and I can the imagine horror that movie. Is, the horror crux is the algorithm. Yeah, totally. And I was like, oh, this like could be a totally different thing. I Like you said, I do not want it. But uh, yeah, that end moment when you realize that Robert Pattinson has to die to make the future happen, I feel like they didn't milk it enough i liked it i thought it was a good grace note i was like wow oh, that's really wholesome and cool i, I liked it oh yeah that's <laughs> it worked fair. for me yeah, yeah that's fair and i uh, that might even just go further to show like i'm not giving this movie the benefit of the doubt and you are and for me like i want them to like squeeze into it and like get me to cry or like get me to have like a more emotional visceral motion about like I was like, yeah, that's kind of a cool twist that he's going to have to walk in freely into his death. I don't think you could really cry because they don't have a strong enough bond. The bond is off screen. The bond is is during adventures that we've never seen. That's they actually just met each other like two days ago. That's fair. So you're not going to be like, oh, my best friend. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind of cool to be like right in between you guys because I, I definitely feel like I felt something when you knew that he would have to sacrifice himself um but at the same time why didn't they milk it why didn't they go further to make you feel something for him um yeah the character development in this movie was weird and i think that's why i didn't i didn't like it as much as i could have maybe you don't feel much for him because you know that he's gonna die in a way that's just like like when you, you're introduced to that device of him sacrificing himself by there just being a dead body there already and that dead body just like takes a bullet and yep. you, you know that he's not gonna like suffer or like have to like jump in the I guess he does jump in the way of a bullet kind of but like I think it's just because you see the death before you see the goodbye speech. Yeah, that's fair. And it's I think like you said where it's like it's over in a second. It's not like he gets shot and then like bleeds out and he's like, oh, I love you, man. And he's like, you just hold on. Just hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's none of that. Yeah. There's none of that. Why do you think that the algorithm is in nine pieces? Why couldn't they have just made it three? Like they break it into thirds and each person gets three pieces. It was just because nine would have taken Sador his whole life to collect versus three or something. Yeah, I think they wanted to show the extent that he went to to end the world because he knew he was going to die. There might be like more nines in the movie, too. I, I wasn't really catching them, but there might be like everything is in nine it's a nice symmetrical kind of yeah, number like th- three threes nah, i don't know who knows maybe this is the best movie ever <laughs> oh what's the deal with all the like knocking people out with gas in this movie the chloroform yeah that's another thing no that- no, no not chloroform the the fact that's like okay when you go back and when you're inverted you have to have this mask on i get it we need yeah. a visual indicator that this guy is not normal yeah. he's got a mask on his face that's how you know um but It's just kind of weird that in the opening scene in the movie where they knock out that orchestra with gas and then they go to Oslo and again, they're filling rooms with gas. There's just so much knockout gas in this movie. I don't know. Did they use that in the opening orchestra scene because because Neil was there and he had to have a gas mask on because he was inverted or was he even inverted? He was inverted. He was. He was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think. Well, maybe not, though. He could have he could have inverted himself went back in time inverted again so he's in the past but not inverted and but then he could have used a weapon that was inverted but why that's i had a question why would you ever use an inverted weapon if you're not inverted i don't think that makes sense because like you have to like go to the battlefield and the bullets are already there and you hope that like at the right time people are like in, in between you and that bullet like i don't think it makes sense to have an inverted weapon if you're not inverted yeah it makes more sense that someone was there who was inverted and left a trail and then now I can see that trail of inverted yeah. stuff and yeah. maybe use maybe. it. Or maybe not use it because yeah. we don't know how the mechanics yeah. work. Can we yeah. just use stuff? Yeah. My other complaint, kind of based on gas, movies need to stop pretending that chloroform takes five seconds to work. It takes like 10 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. You can't just it, put it like over someone's That's nose. like a movie trope. Same with like choking. We've, we talked about it before. You can't choke someone out in like five seconds. 
They oh, do that you, in this movie. You can knock people the F out really quick, but you have to have proper technique. And I actually noticed in the bungee scene, they bungee up, hop over the ledge. There's a dude right there. He comes up behind him, puts him in a basically a rear naked choke. And the guy's gets knocked out. <laughs> he put the choke on so crappy. Uh, I was like, that wouldn't work. The way he did it, his like forearm is against the guy's trachea. Yeah. That would make the guy go. <laughs> yeah. And make There's a noise. There's a lot of that. He needs to sink it so the guy's neck is right in the elbow so that the blood can't go up to your brain on either side of your neck. You got two carotids. It didn't do it. And I was like, ah, why yeah. not? They have like, obviously the people who are doing the fight choreography, they are martial good. artists. Yeah. They know how to choke people out. I just don't know why they don't yeah. make sure that's done. So, nicely. Yeah, the same, like the silence pistol being perfectly quiet, but it's like silence pistols are actually still pretty loud. And like, if you get shot like in the heart, you, you, you don't go like, down quietly you're like ah <laughs> like it's just i don't silly, mind stuff like crappy that too much. stealth movies shit. there's no pain that you see like yeah almost no pain yeah. sarah needs more pain <laughs> i need pain <laughs> well that's the thing with these movies they're always trying to toe the line between being like artistic and blockbusters so i think he's just like i want this movie to be pg i want there to be lots of shooting but i want it to be shown to as many people as possible to make as much money as possible must be pg-13 because there's blood right I'm not familiar, actually, with the U.S. and Canadian I think if it, ratings. Yeah, who knows? Who cares? Who cares? It's probably not 14A in it's, Canada. No, no, it's PG-13. Not enough pain for me. That's all I got to <laughs> say. We need the, the Snyder cut of Tenet. Yeah. We need to do... I really want to do the platform. Have you seen the platform, sir? No. Oh, oh you got to see the platform. I don't know anything about it. You so guys. Do you want to do it? it? I want to do it. I don't know what we're doing next. I know a couple moves from now, we're back into Marvel. Oh, yeah, because we're doing one before. We're doing uh, one like every fourth one. Oh, we're into uh, Infinity War. Yes, we're doing Infinity War. But but we we have like two, at least two or three episodes before that. So we need to figure out what we're doing. And I vote the platform because we've done a few blockbusters in a row. And I want to do a foreign film that's really weird and creepy. I would love to watch a foreign film. Subs, not dubs. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, if you follow us on Twitter, you can check out what we're going to do there. We're going to post it on the community page of YouTube as well. So we'll that you know. is at Carpool Critics on Twitter. And you can also email us, carpoolcriticspodcast at gmail.com. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>